And so, Lord, you're all around me. You surround me. And yet, I don't perceive you. So, Lord God, I pray that right now with your mighty right arm, your right hand of power, you would reach down from heaven and massage my brain, massage everyone's brain in this room. And through the power of your spirit, I pray that you would help us to understand your word, help us to see your living word and to understand your written word. In Jesus' name. Amen. And that's what God is doing today. He's calling people for, out of the, the, the world for his name, whether they come from the Muslim world or the Buddhist world or the Christian world or the non-believing world. Uh, they are members of the body of Christ because they've been called by God. They may not even know the name of Jesus, but uh, they know in their heart that they need something that they don't have and they turn to the only light that they have. And I think that they are saved and that they're going to be with us in heaven. Well, what I hear you saying is that it's possible for Jesus Christ to come into a human heart and soul and life, even if they've been born in darkness and have never had an exposure to the Bible. Is that a correct interpretation of what you're saying? Yes, it is. Several years ago, I heard uh, Tony Campolo uh, share a story that Billy Graham shared with him that Billy said he couldn't really share in, in public very often. It happened on an evangelism trip somewhere in Southeast Asia, like Thailand or China, someplace like that. Evangelism, euangelia in Greek, means good news. To announce good news is to do evangelism. Anyway, Billy Graham was walking up this mountain to share the, the gospel at a, uh, a monastery by invitation when he noticed this monk uh, praying over on the side of the road and praying intently, and he felt led by the Spirit to go over and share with this monk the story of Jesus. So with his interpreter, he approached the man, he opened his Bible, and he began to tell him how God became a man lived and loved, suffered and died for each one of us in order that we might live like him and that we might love like, like him. As Billy spoke, he, he noticed tears streaming down the monk's cheek. He didn't know quite what to think of that. And then he handed the man a Bible. Through tears and through his interpreter, the monk responded. He said, you're, you're giving me this book? How can I thank you? I've never had a gift like this. You see, sir, I, I have known this man my entire life. I, I've always known him. And even as you were reading from this book, within me, he was saying, this man's talking about me. He's talking about me. And when you said the name Jesus, he said to me, that's my name. That's, that's my name. I've always known him, said the monk, and now I know just what he did for me. Isn't that an incredible story? It's almost straight out of the book of Acts, chapter 17. Remember when Paul found the altar to the unknown God in Athens, complimented the pagans, quoted their philosophers, saying, we are indeed his offspring, and in him we live and move and have our being, and indeed he is not far from each one of us. Well, this monk said to Billy Graham, you're giving me this book? How could I ever thank you? I've never received a gift like this. You know, that's basically the same response that I get whenever I open the Bible and I say to someone, I would like to read you from the scriptures, read you some scripture. Not, not, not at all. Sometimes Christians will say this to me, Peter, we love the stories about your kids and passing the ball, you know, and, and movie clips and stuff like that. We like it even when you talk about Jesus, but scripture's confusing, and it's offensive, kinda. It's kind of offensive, and, and yet I'm talking about the Jesus that I find in, in scripture, same scripture. So why is it confusing and offensive to some of us? 
some, some of the time. Billy Graham told the story and then he told Tony Campolo that he didn't share it often in public because it offended evangelical American Christians. It's news of salvation. Why would it offend and confuse Christians, evangelical Christians? If you Google Billy Graham denies Jesus, you'll find all sorts of posts taking you back to that interview with Robert Schuller, where Graham suggests that people can know Jesus even if they do not yet know his name. And what's his name? Jesus is the Anglicized version, but the, in, in Aramaic, Yeshua. It means God is salvation. Scripture says that we must all stand before his throne, the judgment seat of Christ. If a fellow didn't know his name, perhaps Jesus would just tell him his name. My name is Jesus. It means salvation. <laughs> is that good news to you or bad? So why do Christians find Scripture confusing and offensive? Why do we seem to think sometimes that the good news isn't good? Why does news of salvation confuse and offend us? Why do Christians so often look, like, look so little like, like Christ and some non-Christians just seem to be so Christian, you know what I mean? I mean, that's kind of offensive and confusing. In Romans 2, Paul argued that the Jews and the Gentiles, Christians and non-Christians, indeed, he argued that all humanity, this is what we've been talking about, he argued that all of humanity will be judged by the same judgment, and then he writes this, verse 28, or yeah, verse 28, no one is a Jew. And last time we said that when we hear the word Jew, we really should probably hear the word uh, Christian. No one is a Jew or a Christian who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision or baptism, for instance, outward and physical, but a Jew or a Christian is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise, a Christian's praise, is not from man, but from God. Then Paul anticipates a response, chapter three, verse one. Then what advantage has the Jew? Let me paraphrase, or rephrase. What's the point of being a Christian? If a Christian isn't better than a Buddhist monk on the side of the road somewhere over in Southeast Asia, what's the point of you know, reading scripture and preaching the gospel? If Jesus doesn't belong to us, <laughs> what's the point of Jesus? If Jesus won't stay in church but can just show up wherever he wants, why follow him? If Jesus can't just show up in the heart of a, if he can just show up in the heart of a, of a, of a Buddhist, we can just, why talk about Jesus at all? If we don't win the game by beating our neighbor, what's the point of loving our neighbor and loving God as, as we love our, ourselves? If we don't win the game, what's the point of playing the game? What advantage has the Christian? Romans 3 verse 1. Then what advantage has the Christian? What advantage has the Jew? What is the value of circumcision or baptism? Paul's response, much, in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, the, the logion in Greek, literally the words of God. Jesus is the logos, right, the word of God. And scripture is the logion, the words of God written in a book. In a book. The, the Buddhist monk, knew the living word of God, and he was profoundly thankful for the written words of God. We American Christians possess the written words of God, the Bible. Almost every American I know has a Bible. But we usually don't read the written words of God and are even offended by them at times, and certainly offended by the living word of God when he shows up and does stuff that we haven't approved of. Romans 3 verse 1, then what advantage has the Christian or the Jew or what is the value of circumcision or baptism or communion or going to church or doing good deeds or passing the ball? Much in every way, writes Paul. To begin with, the Jews or the Christians were entrusted with the oracles, the logion, the, the Bible of God. What if some were unfaithful? You see, Paul is about to address this great mystery. Why do Gentiles get so excited about Jews, Jesus, and, and Jews get so confused and offended by Jesus? That's like asking, why do some non-Christians seem so much like Christians, 
And so many Christians appear to be so non-Christian. And even get accused and offended by, by, by Jesus. Verse three, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? That can also be translated as we've learned. What if some lack faith? Does their lack of faith nullify God's faith? We're saved by grace through faith, but, but whose faith? Verse three, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faith or the faithfulness of, of God? Does it? Well, I mean, yeah, right? That's what, what we kind of say. We say, if you don't have faith in God, God cannot have faith in you or be faithful to himself and his word to make you in his own image. Verse three, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness, their lack of faith, nullify the faith or the faithfulness of God? By no means. <laughs> My Greek professor, he really did say this to us several times. He said, look, whenever you're translating that phrase, me genoito, in Greek, it should be translated, hell no, because Paul is looking for the most powerful negative that he can find in the Greek language. Literally, meganoito, may it not exist or become, may it not be. Romans 3, 4, hell no, by no means, let it not be true. But let God be true. Though everyone were a liar. Literally, let God be true and let every man, singular, let every Adam be a liar. Literally, let God be true and let every man be a liar. But I don't think I've ever met a man that actually did that in the sanctuary of his own soul. Not entirely. Let God be true and every man be a liar. Every man assumes that he is true and God is divided and unchanging and probably not real. <laughs> like nowhere and no when. Ever since the Enlightenment, we say, I think, therefore I am, and maybe God exists. And God says, I am that I am, and therefore you think, and one day you will exist. Paul says, let God be true. It's, an, it's a passive imperative verb. It means you can't make him true, but you must allow him to be who he is. Let God be true. Alethes is translated true, literally not hidden. Let God be undivided, unchanging, and truly real. Let God be entirely constant. Let God be true, but let all people and every person be a liar. My experience is that liberals will let most people be true and just conservatives be liars. Conservatives will let themselves be true and liberals be liars. But, but, but Paul, Paul won't let conservatives or liberals, Pharisees or Sadducees, Jews or Gentiles, Buddhists or Christians be true. He claims that all are liars. Let God be true, but let all and every Adam be a liar. Sustes. Let all and every person, which would include yourself, be false. A false person. And check it out, that's an, that's an oracle of God. Psalm 116, verse 11. I said in my alarm, probably David is writing this, I said in my alarm, alarm all mankind, all Adam are liars. All! Gah, that's offensive! Right? And it's kind of confusing. Confusing why? Because if we are untrue, right? If you are untrue, how could you ever know what is true? Now, if you like big words, which I do, they're helpful at parties, that's the problem of epistemology. How can I know the truth if I am untrue? How could I ever judge another judgment, let alone the judgment of God, who is the truth, if I, the judger of the judge, am untrue? Well, Paul continues with more oracles of God. You, he's got tons of them, by the way. He's gonna quote scripture right and left. In the words of David, Psalm 51, he writes, that you, Yahweh, may be justified, proved right, 
in your logos, your words, and prevail when you are judged. We're gonna look at this more next week, but pay close attention because Paul is claiming that David is claiming that he sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba so that God could judge David's sin and we all could judge God's judgment of David's sin and justify God's judgment saying, dang, that's a good judgment. Now, see, that's confusing. And it's offensive because it's the exact opposite of our judgment of God's judgment. It's upside down and backwards. We think we sinned, right? And so God judged. Paul is saying, nope, God judged. And so we sinned that we might experience God's judgment and justify God's judgment saying, dang, that's a good judgment. In fact, I think that might be the good that you may be justified, that means proved right, declared right, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Verse five, but if our unrighteousness, if our bad judgment serves to show the righteousness, the good judgment of God, what do we say? That God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way, by no means, hell no! No meganoita. You're looking at this upside down backwards instead of forwards. Verse five, is God unrighteous to inflict wrath on us, asked Paul. Verse six, hell no. For then otherwise, how could God judge the world? Listen closely. We think, we send, and so God judges, and so God inflicts his wrath, revealing his judgment. Paul is saying God judged, so we send, so God could inflict wrath, revealing his judgment, so that we could justify his judgment, saying, dang, that is a good judgment. Maybe even fall down and worship his judgment. Well, that judgment is goodness, and that judgment is life. Verse five, is God unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? Hell no, for then otherwise, how could God judge the world? Paul talks as if the entire cosmos was created, subject to futility, consigned to disobedience, just to reveal the judgment of God. He talks as if we were untrue, just to reveal that God is true, such that we would know that God is true and good and life eternal. He, he talks as if God and his judgment is the universal constant. And everything else, including us, is relative to him. The judgment of God. Verse seven, but if through my lie, if through my false self, my falsehood, God's truth abounds to his glory. Why am I still being condemned or judged, is, is literal, judged as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come, as some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation, literally judgment on them, is just. What then? Are we any better off? Some translate that. Are we any worse off? Um, some others translate that, uh, so then are we excused? You know, if we're consigned to disobedience, are we excused for disobedience? In answer to all these questions, Paul writes, no, not at all. For we have already charged, we've already established that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. All are faithless liars. Then Paul quotes more oracles as if to say, look, the Bible has said this all along. This should not come as a surprise to you. Chapter two, verse 17, the day you eat of it, dying you will die. Not just some of you, Adam. All of you, Adam, that's mankind. That's original sin, which we all commit because we are all untrue. But original sin follows and precedes an original blessing, a blessing that is the beginning and the end of all space and time because it is eternal, in other words, because God is true. 
and faithful. G Genesis 1, verse 26, let us make Adam in our image and our likeness. 31, and God saw everything they had made him. Behold, check it out, it was very good. On the seventh day, God finished his work. You know what, I bet he said, it is finished. When, when he, that's what I think, I think he said that, it is finished. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. That means different than the other kind of days because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. God's rest is eternal. You see, original sin is encased in original blessing like a womb, which is encased in the body of a mother. The lie is temporal. The truth is undivided, unchanging, ubiquitous, and eternal. So there's a reason that, that we find all of this so deeply confusing and offensive. There's a reason that the oracles of God sound like insanity in this world of space and time. There's a reason that the good news doesn't sound good, even to Christians. A reason that evangelicals are offended by the gospel is a reason we try to save people from God who is the savior. A reason we teach people to hide from the judgment of God who is love and only loves. A reason why Christians are offended by Christ and look so little like him. A reason we prefer dead words on a paper to the living words showing up somewhere on the other side of the world in the heart of a Buddhist monk. And that is that we will not let God be true and every man be a liar. If we let God be true, undivided, unchanging, ubiquitous, and eternal, then we must let ourselves be divided, changeable, limited, and temporal, as in dead. And you see, that is profoundly offensive. But if we let, if we let ourselves, if we allow ourselves to be deeply offended by the judgment of God, perhaps we'd be saved by the judgment of God. I mean like die with him and rise with him. And then all of this, scripture and our entire world would no longer be so confusing. Jesus said, blessed, happy, fun is he that is not offended at me. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. That's the judgment, said Jesus. And then he said, I am the light. If you've been in the dark for a while, the light can be terribly offensive. But if you allow yourself to be offended, the light will cease to be offensive and everything will begin to make sense because the light will begin to make sense of you. God is light, writes John. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. At the turn of the last century, reality had grown rather confusing. For the previous 200 years, since the Enlightenment's Enlightenment and Isaac Newton's Principia Mathematica, many thought that we basically had reality figured out. But at the dawn of the 20th century, not so much. Gravity had never really even made sense to Isaac Newton, and he said that. Light was giving everyone a headache. In the 1860s, Maxwell argued that light was actually uh, electromagnetic radiation, vibrations, uh, and he calculated the speed, uh, the speed of light. In 1887, Mickelson and Morley, in an absolutely amazing, fantastic um, experiment, uh, they conducted this experiment, and, and the experiment seemed to indicate something no one expected, that light traveled at a constant speed relative to an observer, regardless of the observer's motion, or frame of reference. In 1905, a 24-year-old young man named Albert Einstein had been unable to find a teaching job, and so he took a job at the, as a clerk at the Swiss patent office. His father uh, had recently died, thinking that young Albert was a failure, but the job at the patent office gave Albert time to daydream, and his daydreams revolutionized our world. 
or I should say our understanding of our world. In biblical terminology, they caused every physicist to repent. That means think about everything differently. For Einstein, it all began with a boyhood daydream uh, about light. Since he was a boy, he had tried to imagine how he would experience reality if he were traveling on a beam of light. One day, riding the bus home from the patent office, he imagined that the bus was approaching the speed of light as he turned and looked at the town clock tower in Bern, Switzerland. It dawned on him that if the bus were approaching the speed of light, the hands on the clock would appear to slow down and then stand still. But not just appear to stand still, actually stand still for him if he were light. But we are not light, are we? We are matter and energy moving through space and time. Right? Well, until Einstein, and at least since the Enlightenment, scientists had assumed that matter and energy, and most definitely space and time, were constants. And then they built their house upon that foundation. But Einstein jacked up the whole house and suggested a new foundation. He suggested that we're looking at reality upside down and, and backwards. He took the speed of light as a constant, and suddenly everything else changed. This is his most famous equation there at the top, E equals mc squared. E is, variable, standing, is a variable standing for energy. Mass is also a variable, uh, or m is a variable standing for, for mass, but c is a constant. It's the speed of light in a, in a vacuum. It means that matter can become energy, and energy can become matter. Speed equals distance divided by time. We all know that. That's S equals D over T, miles per hour, minutes, or feet per second, whatever. But if the speed of light is, is a constant, then distance and time must be variable relative to, to it, as if a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years really is a day, depending on, you know, where you're standing. But light, light remains the same. As Brian Greene uh, writes in The Elegant Universe, light does not get old. Doesn't get old. Einstein's special theory of relativity led to Einstein's general theory of relativity, which postulates that gravity is a curvature in the flexible fabric of space and time, that is, space-time. It all sounds absurd because, you see, we're so used to our limited frame of reference. And yet this has all been verified over and over and over again. Your GPS would not work if this were not true. General relativity was first proven to be true on May 29, 1919, during a solar eclipse but it is just now making its way into our collective consciousness. Or maybe I should say making its way back into our collective consciousness because people haven't always believed that man is the measure of all things. At one time, people even believed that the light of the world is the measure of all things. That is the judgment of all things, the judgment. Well, in the last hundred years, we've learned some fascinating things about light. You got YouTube, you can watch this stuff. Um, but these are just a few. Number one, it's a particle and a wave. A at least it appears that way to us. To us, it looks like two contradictory things. And, and weirder still, our judgment seems to determine which of those two things it appears to be. And yet we know that light is one unified thing, so maybe we are two contradictory things. So when we judge light, perhaps the light is actually judging us. We think it's two. But we are two. And light is one and undivided. That's number one. Number two, it doesn't change. To us, it appears to change. But according to Einstein, a photon of light doesn't experience the passage of time. And yet, you know, we can see and hear light that was emitted at the point of the Big Bang, the cosmic background radiation. For a photon of that light, all space and time, all matter and energy must be somehow present, somehow present in something like an eternal, an eternal now. 
We think the light changes, but maybe we change. After all, we are balls of matter and energy moving through space-time. Number three, light is ubiquitous. It's everywhere and every when. That is, in light, we actually live, move, and have our being. Even in the dark, there's light. It, it turns out that our eyes can only see a small sliver of the spectrum of electromagnetic, vi electromagnetic vibrations that we call light. Even weirder, physicists now say that light is more than a spectrum of vibrations. It's a ubiquitous, ever-present quantum field. So get this. In light, we truly live. Oh, sorry, my tooth whistled. I have a fake tooth. But anyway, in light, we truly live and move and have our being. And when we see the light, we are witnessing a vibration in a quantum field, much like a word, which is a vibration in the atmosphere all around us. Scripture says God is light. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Ephesians 5.8, Paul writes, you, Ephesians and sanctuarians, were darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Holy Crap, I mean, if you took those statements seriously, if we take those statements seriously, it'll jack up your house and replace the foundation. You'll repent for, you'll realize that you were looking at everything upside down and backwards. And you'll begin to walk as children of light because you are right now. I'm calling it St. Paul's theological theory of relativity. And now you should ask, well, how much of this, Peter, is a metaphor? How much is Scripture talking about seeing with the eyes in your head, Peter, as opposed to seeing with the eyes in your heart? How much is physical? How much is spiritual? And is light spiritual or physical? Is God spiritual or physical? And Peter, what's the different answer? I don't know. I really don't know. But if this discussion of light is not helpful to you, St. Paul's theological theory of relativity can be stated in a different way. And I quote Romans 3, verse 3, does our faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Hell no! Let God be true! That's the constant! Sorry, I get worked up, and I'm not yelling at anybody, okay? I'm just talking to myself. Let God be true. That's the constant and let every man be false. That's the variable. Take a look at this picture of a man on a, on a tree in a garden, or look at this picture of a man on a tree in another garden on Mount Calvary, or look at this picture of another man on a tree in the garden city of the New Jerusalem. What is it that's hanging on the tree? The constant, the truth, the light of the world. That's the revelation of God who is love. That's the good in human flesh hanging on a tree like fruit. That's the life eternal. That's God and the judgment of God, the Word of God. So is he divided? Does he change? And when and where is he? Your answer might depend on your frame of reference. That is, do you let God be true? the atom on the tree, the man on the tree, let him be true, that is undivided, unchanging, and ubiquitous, or do you let yourself be true? Undivided, unchanging, and ubiquitous. You see, maybe God is not divided. Maybe God is not good and evil, life and death, light and dark, not love and the opposite of love, whatever you call that, wrath or justice or whatever. Maybe God is one, and each of us is two. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. 
And maybe God doesn't change or change his mind about us, but maybe we do change and he changes our mind about him. And maybe this just didn't happen 10,000, whatever, thousand years ago in the Garden of Eden, and it didn't just happen 2,000 years ago in the Garden on Mount Calvary, or only happen in the future in the Garden City of the New Jerusalem. Maybe it's ubiquitous, because it's the edge of space, time, and eternity. Maybe it's the edge of creation and the thoughts of God. It's the Word of God. Maybe the man, the Adam on the tree, is true, and every one of us is false. Maybe this is the undivided, unchanging, ubiquitous judgment of God. If so, how could you know? How could you judge the judgment of God? How could you know that he is true and every man, including yourself, is a liar. You see, that's the problem of epistemology. How could you know whether or not God or the Word of God is true if you, the knower, are untrue? You can't simply choose to know, you know, by like running experiments on God, like you'd run an experiment on a mouse in a maze or a chemical in a beaker. How could you judge whether or not the truth is true? How could Adam or Eve know that the word of God is good and the lie of the snake is not good but evil? It's not life but death. Perhaps they could not know unless they took what existentialists would call a leap, unless they made a choice, a bad choice. I mean, they couldn't make a good choice because they didn't know what the good was. They made a choice, a bad choice. And, and of course, they, they, um, the choice was bad, as they soon discovered, because they chose to take the life of the good in flesh hanging on the tree and everything died. That's our choice. Another way to say that is that's our judgment. It's called sin. They made a choice, and we all make that choice, and when we, have, we make that choice when we have no knowledge of good and evil. That's called your first sin, your original sin. Every man makes that choice and becomes a sinner, becomes false, a false self. Every man makes that choice, but the God-man also makes a choice. As we take his life, he gives his life, saying, Father, let them, a fee me. Father, forgive them. He makes a choice in time, but he is the choice of eternity. Undivided, unchanging, and ubiquitous, the judgment of God. You were darkness in space and time, but you are now the image and likeness of God in all eternity. He cries, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, and that is the very spirit that rises in the darkness of your soul, crying, Abba, Daddy, Father. We can only know because we have been known by God. We can only know because we judge God's judgment and everything dies. That's called sin. And because God then judges our judgment and everything lives, that's called grace. And then we judge God's judgment of our bad judgment and say, dang, that's really a good judgment. Thank you. And suddenly we're sitting in the kingdom of God because that's heaven. Our judgment is a temporal illusion, and God's judgment is reality. When you let God be true and let every man be a liar, God offends the hell out of you and creates a new reality within you. He makes sense of you and you become who it is that you truly are. He destroys the false you and creates the true you in its place. In other words, you are saved by grace through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God that no one should boast. No one boast and all be thankful. <laughs> now people say, well, that's nice, Peter, but what does this mean to me? It literally, 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 every way you could define it, literally means everything. 
But to give an example, it means you can at least enjoy Thanksgiving. I titled this sermon, Relativity and Thanksgiving. So if you would, this is what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes, all right? Just close your eyes. Don't open them until I tell you. And I want you to think of all your relatives at Thanksgiving, okay? Think of all your relatives at Thanksgiving. If you ate alone this year, that's fine. Think of all your relatives from every year. Blood relatives, any relative, anyone related to you. Imagine everyone together at like Thanksgiving dinner or a great banquet, okay? Just look around the table. Imagine all of them. Imagine your husband or your wife, your ex-wife, your, your mom, your dad, stepmom, stepdad, grandma who, grandma who has dementia, your cousin who just got out of jail, your crazy niece who left home and became a Buddhist somewhere in Thailand. Imagine a couple freeloading neighbors that, you know, just get on your nerve. Imagine some Republicans, imagine some Democrats, imagine some anti-vaxxers, and then imagine some hyper-zealous legalistic vaxxers. Imagine all your relatives at Thanksgiving. You got it? Now, in your mind, let all of them be true. That, that is, expect them and expect yourself to be faithful and, and true. We optimists do that, right? We say to ourselves, this year it's going to be different. Well, if you expect everyone to be true, you'll soon discover that they don't all agree. So someone must be lying. And you will have a terribly disappointing Denver dinner, not, not be thankful, and maybe even curse God for ever creating people in the first place. That's what will happen. So maybe, maybe now you could just let some of them be true or at least partly true. And then, of course, you'd have to let yourself be true in order that you would know whether or not they're true, and this is what most of us do. Well, if you expect some to be true or partly true, you'll begin asking who's true and who's not true. What's right and what's wrong? What's right, who's right, and who's wrong? Who paid for the turkey and who didn't pay for the turkey? And can a Buddhist even be grateful for turkeys? They don't even know that Jesus made turkeys. And what right does my ex-wife have to be so happy? And then you think, crap, I'm not happy, and I'm not thankful. I'm only pretending to be thankful on Thanksgiving. I'm divided, I'm miserable, I suck. But now, try something else. Look around at all of them and let God be true. And so let every man, woman, and child be a liar. That sounds incredibly confusing and offensive, but I think something miraculous will begin to happen because as you do that, you begin to realize that no one can pay for the turkey. No one can deserve one ounce of stuffing if God is true and every man is a liar, everything that's anything is grace, including your very knowledge of grace. You realize that you are a sinner and everyone at the table is a sinner and so all are enslaved to sin and even dead in their trespasses and sin, incapable of choosing the good. So none is right and everyone is wrong. And so you realize that if anyone is right or righteous, it's not their righteousness. And if anyone speaks the truth, it's actually not them that's speaking. It's Jesus in them speaking. Even your crazy niece who became a Buddhist in Thailand, 
And if you believe that this is true, it's not even you that's believing it's true. It's Christ in you, believing in you, rising from the dead in you. For although you have been faithless, he remains faithful to you and in you and even through you, for you actually are the judgment of God. You are his creation, and you have just stepped foot in his kingdom. reality. And so your ex-wife asks you to pass the turkey, the butterball turkey, and so you pass the ball, and it's fun. It's the judgment of God. And now you can open your eyes. It's this. He broke it, saying, this is my body given to you. And then said, this is the cup. This is the covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you. Now is time for dinner. Amen. So Jesus, thank you that you are our everything and we will adore you. Amen. Now I know I talked about a lot of weird stuff because we talked about Einstein. Um, but take a look at that picture. I, I keep showing you that picture because I want you to realize well, that, that picture, well, it's kind of like this picture, right? Right here. And we're all those people at the base of that tree. Einstein said that when he was riding on the bus and he looked back at the clock and he had that thought that maybe light is a constant, there was like a storm, a storm of ideas that flooded his mind that gave birth to all these new, new theories. See, I... I I just think that's helpful because I think we're in that picture and we come here to remember what is constant. Is man the measure of all things or is God the measure of us? If you take the frame of reference of the people at the base of the tree, well, life gets pretty confusing. And you'll find that you're offended by the presence of the man on the tree. It's because you've believed a lie from that snake that you can make yourself in the image of God, that you are the creator, that you are the judge. But in reality, your judgment is nothing. It's an empty void. A lot of words for that in Scripture. But that's okay, because God's judgment is true. But when you begin to take the perspective of the eschatos Adam, the man on the tree, well, at first it is offensive because it offends your psyche. Your, you see, your imagination of reality is called a psyche. It offends your psyche, and you're being offended by his psyche. But if you lose your psyche and find your psyche in the man on the tree, something incredible begins to happen. All sorts of things begin to make sense, and the judgment of God begins to manifest in you, and the judgment of God is absolutely good, and the judgment of God is absolutely life. And you see, that's why we come here each Sunday, to imagine what's true. Some theologians said, imagining what's true is called faith. Another way to say that is, believe the gospel. In Jesus' name. Amen.